Good evening and welcome back to the shop here in beautiful Canterbury, New Hampshire. I want to introduce to you the whole uh, technique of inlaying butterfly, oh, I don't call them butterflies, bow tie <laughs> inlays. They look a little like a butterfly, right, from the, uh, an angle. We're going to do that into an unusual project tonight. Now, usually when you see this type of bow tie inlay, it's been kind of popularized lately by seeing them in slab tables. A lot of people have started in the last, I guess, 10 years. Uh, slab tables have gone crazy, maybe in the last five. And many times you get a large plank of, of uh, usually they're two inches thick, just a, a big cutting. And quite often, it seems like walnut is one of the most popular. And usually you'll have like a, a large check at one end or, or not. And oftentimes that's braced by inlaying a bow tie, like a solid piece of wood shaped in this way so that when it inlays across the crack, it's a bridge of reinforcement to keep that crack stable and even though it's right out there in plain sight, it's kind of decorative at the same time. So it serves both purposes to be a really nice looking feature. Now this whole thing really, I think the initiator of this whole thing was George Nakashima, who built uh, a lot of slab type furniture in New Hope, Pennsylvania. He was an Asian uh, maker who was just amazing, and he, he had his own little style of, uh, of furniture, and you should go check out his books if you would like sometime. I've got one right here, um, a George Nakashima, The Nature, Form, and Spirit. He used to go out in his, in his storage bin and look at his massive slabs on the wall and just try to imagine what it wanted to be. <laughs> <laughs> I do that all the time. Just, you know, you want That's what you're doing. Okay. Yeah, I'm out here all the time just stroking my chin, looking at him. Hmm. Anyway, uh, he, was, he was famous. Probably his most famous pieces were are these grand, what they call peace tables. He would take two consecutive slabs, magnificent slabs of walnut, that were huge and and he would take the two consecutive and book match them so you had like a mirror image usually you had like a little curvature or hollow in the middle and he would take that opportunity to put these butterfly bridges across there to reinforce and decorate and they were quite often they were a contrasting wood in a dark ebony um, so that they would really show as a decorative detail while being a strengthener for this. So you can check those out there. You can check out his work online, George Nakashima. I think you'll be inspired, but we're not gonna do that tonight. We're not doing a stinking slab table. We're doing something better. And <laughs> <laughs> what I'm gonna do is inlay it into this piece of pine. This crack clearly needs reinforcing. My great neighbor Ed and I, we like to work in the woods and we like to cut trees and clear the garden, so to speak. And uh, we were out there in the back and we took down this pretty straight pine tree and cut it up into chunks. I kind of kicked myself for not making boards out of it because it's so nice and straight. But, you know, that's the way it goes. So we had, um, these chunks and we we also like to work out a little bit in his basement he Ed's, Ed's a rugged guy and he's trying to make a man out of me so occasionally he invites me over and says, hey can we start working out you look like you need it so we we're down there actually last week we started again and he was looking at this which turned out to be we made these and we drilled this large hole and this cool. with another one it's almost exactly the same size. They're about 10 inches wide. The other one goes on the other end of the barbell. So you get on the bench and you, you literally look like Fred Flintstone. And you get the barbell and we do bench presses and things with this. This one weighs 
just about, I weighed it today, uh, 32 pounds. The other one is 34 and a half pounds. So we've never really noticed that. We just changed our grip. But over time, they've gotten lighter because the moisture has gone out of them. Like at first, they were perfect round circles. But the thing about wood, when it dries, it dries mostly along the growth rings here. So think of these like rubber bands that have to shrink. So when you have the entire core like this, these are pulling in and out here, there's a lot more movement because they're wider. So this thing has to give and you end up getting a crack like that as this stabilizes. Now this is good and stable. This is bone dry now. So that's stable, but we want to reinforce it because Ed was looking at it the other day and he said, I think we got to replace those, those weights. <laughs> and I said, no, Ed, that's no problem. We're going to put in a George Nakashima bow tie on both sides of that. And then I thought, I'm going to show everybody my method for doing that. And I'm going to show you that method. I'm going to show you look kind of like a, a hand method and then a cool jig that you can use to impress all your friends. And then our timber gym will be back in fine form. All right, so let's get started. Um, I looked at the crack and I wanted it to bridge the crack to be solid enough. Now, if you have a longer crack, you can make several bow ties. And usually it's, it's cool to have them get smaller as you get, as the crack narrows and almost in proportion to the, the size of the gap. So I'm just putting one in here. It wasn't long enough to really warrant two, but I wanted it to go right across in this area. If I go too close here, I'm gonna to be too weak and that could break off. So you wanna step in a little bit and that's about a third of the way in. And I used this paper stock. I was able to trace and I thought, I think this length, like about five and a half by two and a quarter would be good. So I just quickly cut this out of paper and I, you know, I set it on there, I thought that's pretty nice. I'm gonna go with that. So. I decided to make a template a little more firm. So I made this, I got this eighth inch piece of material to be my bow tie template. And it is five and a half inches long and two and a quarter wide. So we can use this and just make some angled lines coming in. So I want this to angle in and I want the middle to end up about an inch. And I figured out that was 12 and a half degrees. <laughs> Not that you have to do that. I think anywhere between 10 and 14 max will work. But right around that, 12 and a half, I think I really like the look of this. We're gonna come in from this side. I'm just coming in from the corner. Make this little template. Okay, now we're gonna fl flip this around to the other side to get our 12 and a half coming the other angle. This is exciting, isn't it? I don't have any more words. Now I'm gonna get the little bevel gauge marked here. Well, this is not technically a bevel gauge, it's Be sure to mention more like a protractor. If you would, how thick, I'm sure you'll talk about how thick the bow tie should be, right? Oh, I will mention, um, yeah, when I get to that material. I'll be there pretty soon. All right, so there you go. It's The lines are in. It's a little asymmetrical, which is fine. So that point is a little higher that way. It's going to be a little asymmetrical. So I'm going to put a star at one end, so I always keep it oriented the right way when I go in. But let's go ahead and bandsaw this out, clean it up, and we'll have our pattern.
All right, so let's clean this up. We could use a file or something, but you know, I think this is a good opportunity to use the, um, the shoulder plane. Now watch, I'm gonna get it started like this. I can only go about an inch with the shoulder plane. And then it starts to hit the middle of the V. Let's just go around. Let's just use it like that for a second. Flip it around. <laughs> what do you know about the metal kinds of bow ties? Anything and how they affect wood movement? Um, I don't think the metal would matter. Usually you're putting it into a stable piece of wood. You can inlay like these out of other material, you know. Um, of course, then you'd be epoxying them in. But now I'm going to take this apart. So I took the front end of the shoulder plane apart and I basically made a bullnose uh, type plane. It's almost like you're holding a chisel in perfect plane with this piece so that now the cutting edge is right out front. So I can use that flat that I just established and just finish it. So the shoulder plane is now riding on the flat and I've got a nice chew. So I could have tried doing this with a file but I've got a nice flat surface there now very quickly. Nice way to clean up a little band sawing. Okay, and let's see that end point should come out. Flip it. I just make this stuff up as I go along actually. <laughs> I, no, I, I think of what tools, you know, what would be optimal. And um, I tried the shoulder plane and then it, I do often use it like this, so it's helpful when you need that kind of bullnose. All right, so I'm gonna put that back together. Okay, so now we've got our pattern. So let's come on over, and now we're gonna set it here. Oh, wait, we're not gonna inlay that. We want something thicker. We want some good material. So I'm gonna go with some thick cherry. I was gonna use walnut, but I couldn't. I didn't have any decent walnut for this. So I'm going to use this cherry. And it's, uh, it's about an inch thick. And that will be nice. That'll do a nice job, I believe. So let's put it on here. What's nice is I save myself some time by cutting the block already to the five and a half length. And it's a little oversized in width. So I'm going to have to go ahead and bandsaw and clean up the other edges. So let's just go ahead and hold that. So Tom, um, Jeff's curious if you have to do um, the bow tie on the top and bottom yeah. of the lock. Okay. Yes, Jeff, I'm gonna do on both sides. So I'm gonna show you the other method on the other side. Okay, oh, before I change that, I wanna put my star. Okay, so that's always gonna be out. I gotta make sure that I keep that oriented properly. All right, let's head over to the bandsaw and cut the real deal. So once again, we got to bring this over and we've got to true these sides up. So we want to try to maintain 90 degrees here so that when we trace it out, we're going to inlay it and it'll fit well without gapping out or getting tighter as it goes in. So again, I'm going to take the um, shoulder plane and we'll... Tom, do all shoulder planes um, come apart like that? Do you know? Um, you know what, I don't think they all do, but 
you can buy them that do. Um, you know, I somebody will have to answer that. Bill said no, they don't all come up. Okay, thank you, Bill. Bill, you, you're the man. You're right there. <laughs> I I don't. <laughs> I should have a larger one too. Like a lot of a lot of these companies sell these hulking like shoulder planes, and I've always thought they were pretty cool looking, but I've never had the need for. Although this is a little wider, this would be nice. But this is a three quarter and it's always served me well. I don't use it a ton, you know? So let's flip it over. We'll do the same thing we did on the other. Now I'm trying to maintain flat by treating this all the same. Oh, this side I'm a little, I'm a little crooked. Let me get my chisel out here. I'm gonna try to flatten this a little bit. Have you ever seen applications where they use the bow tie when there isn't a crack? Um, no. I mean, you know, not not in this manner. There's lots of inlays that, in fact, I've seen actual butterfly inlays. <laughs> but um, Do you mean bow tie? No, actual <laughs> butterflies. Oh. I mean butterflies that time. No, but um, as a decorative effect, you know. Uh, Dave's saying that the uh, shoulder plane needs to be a bull nose to come apart, I guess. What brand are you using? Do you know? I've got a Stanley 92. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. That's decent, but let's flip this around. And how thick is that, Tom? Are you figuring? Did you say? How thick is what? The Th this block? Yes. About an inch thick. Okay. Now, oh, this, I should have said. Now, that's not... Always, um, you got to just kind of eyeball it and decide how thick you want it. You know, if you're going into a slab or something smaller, thinner is fine. You know, I, I just thought I needed more mass for this, um, <laughs> this crazy project. But uh, this should work. Okay, I want to just get it close. It doesn't have to be actually pristine. It's going to get glued in there. There's a, as long as it's generally flat. Now, I'm going to take it apart again one more time. We'll finish this bow tie. Let's hold it right in here. Now it feels like a... It's not... There we go. It's a little hard to do this in that little plywood. But... Works nicely. I mean, you could bring out the old chisel, but that's not that's not doing me any good. If you put a bow tie on one side where the check is, might it not want to check on the opposite side? Uh, no, Lee. Uh, not that it's dry. It's now that it's dry. So that that all happened with that that log basically going from you know, 35% moisture content down to, man, it's bone dry now, you know? So, it's super dry. It's not, it's pretty stable now, especially being white pine, which is quite a stable wood to begin with. I'm kind of rushing this a little bit, but it's, it's actually, do you have anything to say this is my best um, one. about choosing the materials, like contrasting colors or what your options like? Would yeah, you I, I like a contrast. Um, this cherry is going to darken, so it will be more of a contrast. I might put a little bit of oil finish on this. Um, I might even put it on the whole, on the end of the log. I think, I don't think Ed would mind. <laughs> and uh, We could call him and ask. Yeah. He might be watching. That's why I'm saying so many nice things about him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. He is the best neighbor. By far. Did you say Stanley 90 or Stanley 92? 92. Okay. Um, it's decent. I mean, it's nice. 
Oh, I think that that answer, that question was related to this. Um, are you cham is he chamfering the edge at maybe five degrees or is it ninety degrees to the face? It's ninety. I'm not chamfering at all. Uh, I should I should sorry I should say I need to check it. I didn't um, not done yet. So let me just give it a quick eyeball. I did try to stay pretty flat. So I got this trued up. It's squared. It's relatively flat all sides. Now we're gonna transfer the shape onto the end of our piece. This is the manual way, okay? So you're gonna set it there and I'm gonna get a marking knife and I'm gonna knife around, get it in the position I want and I'm gonna knife around. Now before I do this, one of the frustrating things that happens when you're trying to inlay something like this is you get it marked around so far and then it slips. And to get it back exactly where it was is kind of a pain and you want to hit it the first time. So what I like to do is shoot a little pin nail. You could tack a little brad, whatever, in the side, in the back, like that. And I'm using a little spacer so it doesn't bury. So now I got a little spur there, and that won't be in the way at all. That's gonna go, let's see, where do we like it? That looks pretty good right there. So now I'm gonna press those spurs in, and it's nice and solid. Here we go. I'm going to use my marking knife with the flat back against the piece. Now, this is pine, white pine. We've got a few trees around here like this. But um, these woods are full of sugar maples, too, which I love. It's fun to think that people who were able to come here this fall got to see a lot of that. Yeah, that's right can't see with the light in my face. Oh, sorry. Hit that. <laughs> Getting you guys the view. So close. I don't know why I can't capture that learning in my head. It's about a foot further than the camera. <laughs> That's all you have to. All right, so getting a nice knife line here. Now, the kind of cool thing about this and the easier thing, I think, in some ways is that this is end grain. I'm going into the end grain. So when we clean it out, we're going to be taking out, you know, the grain lengthwise. So it actually is easier to remove this way than if the, if the grain is going this way and you're on a big slab table. So occasionally, though, you may have a, a coffee table, like with a large disc that you want to put some cookies in. I mean, put some bow ties in the cookie. The, the large disc is often referred to as a cookie. But... Um, I got that. Now I'm going to take this off. I want to remember this is where my star is, okay, over there. Now, it's hard to see those lines, and I'm going to use a router to route this out. But those are really difficult to see, so I'm going to just make a pen line just inside those so that I can route to the pen line instead. First, I'll just go around and make some dots just inside the corner, like that, just about a sixteenth or so, and now I can go from the dot down, because I want to chisel to the, the line, right? So right now we're, we're just going to try to get the, the bulk of the material out. Um, Danny's curious because he's always um, seen that a lot of people do chamfer the edges to wedge into the cleaned out area. Do you, you don't. Is there a reason? Because I'm going to make it fit perfectly. Now, my, the walls are going to be straight, and um, I'll show you. This is pretty forgiving, this one. But yeah, you can chamfer them, but if you... I mean, you can just chamfer the lead edge, but if you angle... If you angled this whole side like a couple degrees or a degree, when you put it down and you knife around it, then when you go to sl slam it in, it may not want to go the full thickness because you're going to be thicker out here. By the time you jam it in, you really only marked the narrower profile if you're going to be sloping this in. So at the end, I might break this edge just to help it get started, but I don't think we'll need to. If we just go right to that knife line, that's the perfect spot. So 
let's see how it works out. Um, but that's a good question. Like a lot of times when you're going to put in a, a peg or something like that, you definitely want to ease the lead edge. But we don't want to create a wedge shape, like small as it is, with the bow tie or it'll have a hard time going in. We want to get the full depth of this. All right, there you go. Now we're going to route that out. I don't know if it's going to... I'm going to just clamp it to that. Okay, so now I'm going to just route, plunge route. And this comes out pretty easily, like I said, because it's end grade. So I'm going to be cutting. The fibers are all standing this way, so they're kind of hitting the sides of the fibers, and they come free a lot easier. Now I want to plunge the same depth as my thickness of my bow tie. So I'm just going to come to a flat surface and bring down the cutter, which is a half inch straight cutter, hit the surface and lock it in. Okay, so that's zero. So now I'm going to take my, my depth gauge here, my stop, and bring it down. And that's hitting there. So that's also zero. I'm going to raise it, the thickness of the material. I'm just going to stick the piece in there and come down till I'm squeezing on that piece and lock my depth stop. Okay, now that's going to plunge equal to the thickness of that piece. I'm a little over halfway down, so I'm going to go ahead and route this, then I'll plunge the full depth and hit it again. So.
there we go. We've done the main drilling. Now before we can put in the filling, we have to clean up the edges. <laughs> and to do that, we're gonna chisel it out. Now if this was a flat plank, we'd have to get a mallet and really go to town to chop in there and to chop end grain. But this is all the grain is sticking up here. So I'm just gonna use my one inch chisel in this manner. So I'll just pare a little away. Now I'm gonna seat it right into the knife line and hold it as close to 90 as I can, which is probably dead on. So Tom, you, you mentioned something that there was a question about earlier, what the difference would be to do this on end grain versus cross grain. And you just said something that yeah. referred to that. Is there anything else you wanna say about that? Um, just that, yeah, just it'll be more difficult to clean it out because you're going to be coming across the grain. So you could use a, you'd be using a mallet, but um, you'd still be going, mapping it out the same way, just right into a knife line like that. So once we get around, not really great to use a chisel in this way, but like twisting it at the bottom, but these are great chisels, so it can handle it. I'm gonna do it just for this purpose. We'll come back and clean it out a little better than that in a minute. Okay, get this in. But you get the idea. I may not do this whole one so I can yeah, let me, uh, I would go around, clean that whole thing, right? Just basically, just like this. I'll just get this end. I want to get to the other stage. So I have one that I've already gotten cleaned out. I'll show it to you in a second. So that's nice. You get it all crisp and clean into that corner. And then I come in with a chisel like this, just to chop free those fibers at the bottom. Just go around. Free them up. You know, they get all they all get out of there, and then you just finish it up by hand and get it nice clean down inside those corners like that. Okay, so that would go in beautifully right like that. See how it's going? Now, I'm not going to use this one, but I'll show you this other one that... Um, somebody's asking about the brand of chisels. Those are the Veritas PV, PM-V11. Yeah, PM... And the link V11. is in the description yeah. below if you're curious about those. Yeah. All right, so here's doing that exact same thing. I've got a little star there, and... Okay, so this is the one. This is that method. So this one, I just finished cleaning it up, and I'm gonna glue that in in a, in a couple minutes. But I wanna get to the other side. So that's pretty much the manual way. You make your, you make your bow tie, you bandsaw it out, you gotta clean up the sides, make sure they're true, and then mark out around it with a knife, route it, chop it, it's a little time consuming, right? Now, if you're gonna do a bunch of these and you kind of know the size you're gonna make or you could make several templates, you can make a little jig to knock these out a lot faster. So let me set this one aside for a minute. All right, so here we are on the other side and we're gonna put in one with a jig method. Here we go, this is what we're gonna use for our template material to make our uh, bow ties go in a lot faster. But this will be dedicated to one size of bow tie. Um, where's my, okay. So this is, the, this is our template, our little pattern. So we're gonna put this on here. We're gonna trace around it, but I'm gonna show you something in a second where I wanna be a quarter inch away from that to, if I wanna get this shape, I want to be a quarter inch away because my 
I'll show you in a second the method for routing this out. We're going to use collars on the router. All you need is something simple like this. And I've got a washer here. The sides are a quarter inch. So you can just go in there with your washer and hold, hold your piece right in the middle. Let me get it in the middle. And I want to trace around this with a quarter inch. So you can just roll it right like this. Oops, I lost it up there. So just go back over. There you go. It's like Spirograph. Who remembers that? That's crazy. Do you remember that? I do. <laughs> All right, so this is the end. We could make this our star end of our jig. Now, we don't want the corners rounded. We want to square them up a little bit. So I would take a straight edge and just continue this to the corner all around, okay? So I had do this with each one. And then I have to cut this out. So, you know, if you have a scroll saw, that would be great. But what I used was a jigsaw and just drilled a few holes in here and then jigsawed each side right into the corner. And then when I got that sawn out. I'm not going to do that right now. After I got it sawn out, I filed each surface to flatten it up. And I got this. So, here's what you're going to do. You're just going to square up the corners, cut it out, and you're going to have a template like that. So, these are pretty flat on these sides. So, this template is going to cut a bow tie pretty close to this size, exact size, depending on, you know, how well you sawed it out. It doesn't really matter because it's going to give you this same size bow tie, but much easier in some ways. So once you have this, now we can route it into our end piece here. So let me um, come over here. Now we're going to route against the template with a collar. So we're going to put this, we've got a 1 8 inch bit. What I'm going to do is put this collar in the router. Okay, I'm just going to, a lot of plunge routers will come with this universal gap for a collar. And um, if you don't have any of these collars, we put a link for the collars. And thank you, you know who you are who sent me these. Thank you so much for that. I have some other kinds, but I'm using the, the brass ones that are nice. All right, so there you go. This collar is going to ride against the template. It's going to bear against the template. And I've got a 1 8 inch cutter in the middle. And that's going to plunge in. And I can only go about, I don't know, about 3 eighths deep here. So, um, but that'll outline exactly where the block goes. So there's no knifing around or anything like that. And it'll get almost perfectly into the corner because it's just a little eighth inch radius. So that's going to cut an eighth of quarter inch off the side wall. Okay. So let's go ahead and run this one. So I'm going to be basically doing the opposite of what I just did. Instead of tracing around and making my template a quarter inch larger, I'm going to go around with this collar and this cutter that's offset a quarter inch in is going to cut an outline a quarter inch smaller all around. So let's do that and then I'll explain the next phase. All right, so I just want to lay this out about where I want it. Okay, then I'm this way I can place this. It's hard to see, but using that I can use this jig and place it better. Okay, it's a little flexy there. I'm going to put a little shim under there. There we go. And let's just pin nail this in to hold it in place. These will never show. Okay, that's pretty good. All right, now we're going to take this out and go ahead and plunge route.
Okay, I still need to go just one more pass. It's a little deeper. I forgot to clamp this on here. Okay. So there we go, we can pop this off. And I'm gonna mark this as the star end. So there you go. So if you're doing a bunch of these, you just be tacking these templates and you could make smaller versions the same way. You're just gonna outline it with a quarter inch and then you're going to step in the quarter to get that set. Now, I still got to vacate the rest of it the other, the other way. So I'm going to use that straight plunge and get some of that out. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go the full depth on this one because I think you get the idea. But once you, uh, I would just plunge and get that full depth and then I'd come in and I already have the sidewall marked. The sidewall there is, is the, just like the knife line, but it's already plunged to that depth of that eighth inch cutter. So I can use that as my guide. And I didn't go quite far enough on here. But you're just going to do the same thing. Now chiseling straight down using that wall. Now in the corner, you can barely see it, but it's just slightly rounded because of that round eighth inch cutter. It's just a little sixteenth inch radius. So you want to crisp that up so you get a nice true corner down there. And down here as well. You can just pretend this is the full depth. I just want to show you the technique. It's pretty simple to understand once you've seen the first one. All right, now I'm going to go into the corner with that 16th again. I'm just using the chisel flat against the wall and let it guide where I'm going to hit in the corner. There, yeah, that's nice and crisp. Okay. Pine's nice to work with. If this was oak or something, it'd be a little more, a little bit slower. Put some vacuum there.
it's the old bike on the roof <laughs> feeling, right? <laughs> you keep bringing that up. It's exactly the illustration, right? <laughs> Clank. He's referring to a time when I drove into the garage with a bike on the top of the car. You're not the only one who's done that. I bet you somebody in the audience has After done that. After a long trip, forgot it was up there. That's like so easy to do because <laughs> you're sitting in the car. That's what I mean about the camera. That light is sticking up top in front of you. It's funny now, but it was pretty horrific. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, how do you explain that dent in Ooh, the middle of... in the car. The car. <laughs> like the wall, the... Um, I have a thing with garages. I just yeah. To hit. We had a few little repairs on the garage. Although I did one myself. I... It's asking if you could use a pattern bit for the second plunge cut and then clean up the corners. Yeah. Yeah, you could. You could use a... Um, if you had a deep enough... This is quite deep. The one I have is like a um, mortising bit that has the bearing on top. So you'd have to get it down in there and then go around and that's a great idea you could do that several times and plunge deeper but the one I have I, I haven't seen many larger ones the one I have is only like a quarter inch cutter and pretty small so maybe somebody knows but yeah you could you could clean out deeper but you know the thing I guess once you get the the full depth clean it out with that half inches is fine enough but I just wanted to get it clean enough so you can see how the next step fits so I would have been doing that to the full depth but that's all you have to do so you've already you've outlined it and you've cleaned it out with just the template much faster now I'm gonna go to switch out the collar now let me show you a little diagram all right so this is what we just did we had the 5 8 collar, and this is the 1 8 inch cutter. So we plunged and we leaned the collar against the template, so we were getting a space of a quarter inch away from the template. So we cut that kind of negative space in there. Now we're going to switch out, instead of the 5 8 collar, we're going to go down to a 3 8 collar. We're keeping the same 8 inch bit in there. Now this collar, is going to bear against the template which is in the same orientation there when that bears against the template it's going to be cutting a quarter inch away but on the other side of the cutter see so see that center line that light pencil line up here we're on the left side of that line when you switch out this way now because you've got a smaller collar you bumped over the full distance there and you're cutting now on the other side of the cutter. So you've got just an eighth inch here, and then the cutter, so we're gonna be a quarter inch. So this is the setup to route and shape your bow tie. The bow tie is gonna be um, coming out of the same template, but because we use this collar, we're now gonna be cutting exactly on the other side of this line that we established, okay? So we're gonna use this stock. This is a piece of cherry. Another piece, it's kind of angular. We'll get the, the bow tie out of this area here. So let's take the same template, okay? And we're gonna set it on here. Get that stripe pattern there, that looks pretty good. And now we'll tack this in. That's good. And let's clamp her down. Okay, so let's switch out the collar. If I come in here to the router now, I'm going to take this out. We're going to change out our 5 eighths. I'm going to step down to our 3 eighths outside diameter. This doesn't make sense for any reason. You can always go back and look at the drawing. I think you'll see what happens though here. The cut is pretty. Okay, snapping in. Now we're gonna do the same thing. We're just gonna stay against the template the whole way here. We don't wanna 
bobble in. If we do, we're going to cut into our bow tie. Okay. So we also want to mark that this is the star end before we forget. And get our hearing on. Here we go. Let's take this off. What that did was it cut, we only had an eighth inch here, so now we're a quarter inch away, but we're on the outside. So in theory, this bow tie should fit exactly in that space. So we, just, we cut on the opposite side of that. Now I'm gonna bandsaw this out, head over here. I'm gonna just stay off the edge and then we'll clean it up. So I cut it off, I stayed pretty close, but I left just a little bit there. And we're gonna get the rest of that off with the router. So let's look on the router table. You can just spin around here. And I'm just gonna be very careful here. I've got the guard up to trim this off.
So now we've got that. We just have this little roundedness on the inside there from the router bit or from the, the way the, the way that 3 8 inch collar rode against the template. So we just have to true that up. We're just going to bring our chisel in from each side. You're just following. I just got the chisel flat on there and I just push it till it stops. And I'm just going to come in from each side and get it like this. That should pop out. There it is. Okay, so now we've got our bow tie cut out just like that. And let's see if it fits. Now, of course, I would get this the full depth. Look at that. It's going in. I don't want to go any further. I won't get it out. The other one I did clean up and go the full depth with. So I want to show you that. All right, so this is the one that I did with the, the template jig. This is going to go in here. And look at that fit. I mean, just using that jig, I think it's all set to go. So let's throw some glue in there and tap them in. I really don't care how they land like um, flush or slightly proud. I might end up saying that I'm a little, we'll see. I'm just going to put it on here, all inside the hole. So this is not going anywhere. I don't need to put it on the edge of the bow tie itself. Just some in there. There you go. That's all there is. That's all. Is there any trick to how you're going to uh, glue the bark back together? Um, <laughs> I might just put some shrink wrap around, like while I'm holding it. You know, I'll probably just temporarily. That could be another episode. <laughs> Making the perfect dumbbells. All right, there we go. It's in. Let's tap her in. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. Okay, that's in. I can feel it's firmly seated. I'm gonna flip it over. This is the one we did by hand that we knifed around, we plunged. You know, we had to clean this up by hand. So a little different, but same end result, pretty much. Technically, this should not fit as well, right? Let's see, I haven't actually put it all the way. I did, of course, try it. Get that glue a little bit smeared there. Ah, this is satisfying. All right, we're going to set it right there. Oh, yeah. I got a little glue on the log there, but we can watch it'll wash the pencil mark right off pretty much. I'll sand that to finish, but and this will get darker with time, but you can see the strength of that nice one inch bridge holding that crack. Then on this end, same thing. Ah, oh, look at that beautiful piece of cherry in there. So there you have it. Two methods of putting inlaying bow ties. The priceless treasure you've preserved. <laughs> Someday it'll be worth something, right? Mm. Well, thank you once again for hanging out with us here in the shop. All right, everybody. Thanks again for hanging out with us. Yeah. Remember to like, share, and subscribe if you enjoy this content. And also, if you want to go deeper with us, head on over to epicwoodworking.com and you can learn about lots of other courses that we've recorded live previously with full-size drawings. So thanks again on the behalf of the camera lady and myself. We'll look forward to seeing you next time right back here 